Ken? Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Here we are again with Mr. Here John Etheridge. Hey. Hey, hey Danny. How have you been? I've been good. We've been working away, what was it, two weeks? Yeah. Two weeks, three weeks? Yeah, I've been on tour with my, um, you know, with the band, the Sweet Chorus, that does the, uh, I don't, won't say it's Hot Club, because it's not Hot Club, but we do the Grappelli tribute thing. You know, well, it's not really yeah. Grappelli, but well, I talk about Grappelli and we play some tunes and do all that. I can see you've got your uh, Selma guitar there. Your Big time. Ta- Selma type, yeah. <laughs> Selma Rich. Selma Rich, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How was yeah. the tour? Yeah, it's great. It's great. You know, it's a really good band. And and but but what we what we've done is actually, um, well, first of all, I've changed the rhythm guitar so he now plays an L seven, not nice. uh, one of those. So it's more of a Freddie Green sound. And our violinist Chris Garrick, who's amazing. I mean, he doesn't try and do a Grappelli thing, and I don't wouldn't in any way try and do a Django thing. So uh, because I I found, I mean, you're yeah, I know you do it great. So oh, thank I found, you. I found that my um, my whole approach, I think it's how you started. I started in life really on a Gibson SG, and that's my whole technique was developed on SG. Mm-hmm. It doesn't didn't translate too well. It, it, and when I played with Grappelli, I played um, more or less like a kind of fusion style. I mean, if you see any of the clips of me with him, like at the Albert Hall and things. I'm playing almost like a kind of fusion style because mm-hmm. I had no theory at that time. I just played by ear. So I just played and this <laughs> Disney knew all the right chords. So I just earwigged what he was playing and played. And That's good. Well. And, and it did work well. Yeah. And then, and then so, afterwards, go on. Well, I'm just wait. Well, you said you have no, you had no theory in that time. At uh, that time I had no theory. No. Very really? Good. Very little. I, I had, uh, that's not strictly true, but I really didn't have, because I grew up in this era, which is hard for you young guys to understand, where where really nobody taught you anything, and you just copped it by ear from what you'd heard. Yeah. So I copped, copped Django stuff by ear, I copped a bit of jazz by ear, but when I say I had no theory, I had no organized theory. I mean, I wouldn't, I remember when I started teaching when the Grappelli thing ended, I started teaching and people would come up to me and go, hey man, do you play the altered scale over that chord? And I'd go, oh yeah, probably, and rush off and learn what that was. That's and amazing. Come, yeah, 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 come on. And, 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 and it was great because when I started teaching, and I, and I was, you know, I wasn't that young, um, I, I, I learned from the teaching credit, which was actually the best way. So the way I, you'd navigate through it is yeah. be like, you're like that, that's the whole tone thing. It's like a oh, whole tone. Oh, no yeah, keyboard. Well, Sorry, like open it. Like... <laughs> because to tell you the truth, I did have some uh, Joe Pass Django theory down, which is chord tones. Yeah. So, so I kind of, then I worked out, oh yeah, the altered scale is basically what Joe Pass calls the sharp nine, flat nine, flat five, sharp five. So mm-hmm. I worked that out. So I did catch up pretty rapidly. So I can't say I had no theory, but I had quite little theory. And I was basically an ear player. So when I hear that, um, and I hadn't really sat down and studied. In fact, it, you know, on this topic, it was really quite interesting because I finished up with Grappelli in 1981. Mm-hmm. And I didn't touch that music till 98, 99. And when wow. I came back, there was this whole world of Django stuff and Djangoisms and you know and I was kind of amazed you know it was really a, a big deal when I came back it had become a big deal you know people doing like you know what sure with those guitars doing doing the thing and the the way of playing and the kind of everybody worked out how it was done and the rest and, stroke but, technique yeah, that that was like that was it, common it became uh yeah, like I think through like Django books and Michael Horowitz and all these people who put out that yeah, rest right. stroke, like that's gypsy right. picking thing. and Which is amazing. And I thought I was just, uh, just, I just filled, did a little interview for Guitar Techniques and they said, one of the questions was what, what retrospectively, what technique would you like? And I said, well, we grew up with no science of picking at all. And we all did our own thing. All the players of my generation, you know, with Albert Lee, Richard Thompson, Jim Mull, all these people, they've all got their weird ways of picking. 
which in a way gave us an individual sound. But actually, I, I sort of said, I wish there'd be somebody who could have taught me some picking science when I was growing up. But, you know, that's what we are. We, 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 we didn't think about it. It wasn't until I was, I remember this distinctly, I was 27. I just joined the soft machine and an American guy, I can't remember if I said this last time, actually. Sorry if it's a repeat. I remember talking about this recently. American guy came around and said, what are your stuff? You know, so I, I, I said, OK. And I said, and he went, what are you doing with your right hand? I said, I don't know. Right. I don't yeah. Know. Said, yeah. 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 I, I mean, what are your anchor points? And I went, I don't know. And he said, oh, what are you doing? And then I realized I was resting my little finger on the pit guard and picking quite delicately, you know, a bit like a George Benson thing, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, playing like that. And he went, oh, that's what you're doing, is it? I went. Well, yeah, if you say so, that's what I do, because I don't know. I've been thinking about my left hand, I've been thinking about the notes. You know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a strange uh, time, to, I think, to grow. I mean, I did my, most of my growing up practicing in the era right before YouTube, or before YouTube yeah. was very useful. Uh, but yeah, I can't even imagine what it's like now. But the thing I do see from students is that in a way it's kind of shitty because a lot of people try to learn music visually. Like they think yep. that if they're gonna look at where John Etheridge's ah, fingers are, they're okay. gonna somehow understand the music. Right, okay, okay. Yeah, and there's something, and there's yeah. something about listening that's, that gets you so much deeper in the game. Well, yeah. I think that's absolutely true. In fact, that's, it's, you know, a slight thing about that. I remember in the days when, you know, might be doing a bit of television, might be doing a bit of radio. And funnily enough, I'd get more nervous about the radio because I thought, OK, people can really hear this. Mm -hmm. They're distracted by what's going on around and the camera angles. And, and so when I'm doing radio, I better make sure I play really well because people are just getting the sound <laughs> absolutely and that's it's it's so interesting isn't it and, and this whole you know uh thing i was just for some reason recently listening to tal farlow and jimmy rainey those 50s mm -hmm. guys who i haven't listened to for years mm -hmm. and it's great when you come back to that stuff and 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 um what occurred to me that in terms of the right hand is actually how much pulling off they're doing you mm -hmm. don't realize you think it's all it's all picked with those 50s guitarists but there's a lot of not hammering on but the pulling of off on. yeah right much more right. than you think jimmy rainey who was alan holdsworth's favorite jazz guitarist and i can see why because he he he's quite in a way you know he's got the p90 and the little guitar and that that sort of sound you know which i have to say the 50s jazz guitar sound does leave a lot to be desired <laughs> yes and, and but he's, he's quite fluent and he's pulling off quite a lot and he doesn't hammer on but he pulls off and so i was quite interested in that and i thought oh wow because for some reason i was just listening to it from a right hand point of view and um uh because i kind of know what they're doing uh, of course uh, nowadays i know what they're doing you know uh, sure. musically, musically but i'd never really thought about their right hands and how much was picked because i'd always you always assume because Django was pretty well all picked. Mm -hmm. See, if Django had been able to do that, <laughs> there would have been maybe, a little bit more. Yeah, maybe there would have been a bit of. Uh, I yeah, been, I mean, I been, listen, that Danny, I've been deliberately hammering on in my so-called Grappelli gigs, just <laughs> just <laughs> well, you see, you, you, to you, explore you, that you, sound. Yeah, just just to sort of bit annoy annoy the purists. <laughs> <laughs> That's we funny. Started, we started calling it Log Legato Club. <laughs> I mean, Dude, you're gonna you're gonna start getting like. I mean, I've always been more of a picker, but I I was deliberately doing some hammer on. <laughs> Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah, club. The, you're gonna get the Django Mafia to chop off yeah, two exactly, of your fingers. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Which of course is, I mean, I mean, you're using the right guitar. That's one thing I do is I use the wrong guitar almost deliberately. It's like I'm mm -hmm. not almost deliberate because uh, the problem I ha find with those guitars is I love them, but what I want is actually if I'm playing a ballad, I want to be able to hold the note for 
So I, I use my Collins, which is a beautiful guitar. But it's a what do you mean? Guitar. What do you mean you want to be able to hold the note to sustain or? Yes, get sustain. I just find with especially with the, the pretty bouche, mm -hmm. it's so good for the attack. It's so good for playing fast. It sure. Speaks so quickly. Mm -hmm. But it speaks quickly. But but of course, what you lose is the is the is uh, being able to you know just you know, you wail. Can. Can yeah, it, you can wail. On my Collins, I can kind of wail a bit, and um, mm -hmm. and also the hammer on is is good on that. So I use that, um, and I know that's kind of uh, there again. That's really the purest. We just go. But you know, with Grappelli, I used a Martin. I first yeah. well, I used an Ovation, and then I used a Martin OM18. It didn't sound right. Right. <laughs> but but Grappelli didn't want you to sound like no, Django. That didn't. wasn't the gig. I'm sure. I have to say. And I don't know if I said this before, but I sometimes say this to people and they're crestfallen. The first thing he said when you we pick up the guitar to go boom, chink, boom, he go, don't play like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what? interesting. I went, I said that to a guy in Sweden who was a big fan. I was playing there with, with this band and I was talking to him and I told him he was absolutely crestfallen. So I, I don't say that to people but he really went on about that and wouldn't yeah. have you do that so, so Diz Dizzle if you listen to Diz who was the best rhythm guitarist he had he plays more like Freddie Green mm -hmm. chunk, 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 fall to the bar and that's what I get Dave to do in my band chunk, 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 rather than chunk, 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 chunk. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean it's it's so it, it's interesting I mean those guys those gypsy guys that whole style of music is is so fusion in a sense because yes. they were just listening to jazz yes. interpreting it from like whatever kind of gypsy yes. music they came yes. from from that prism yes. and the one thing that you really see in that style is that there's zero blues in it it's zero this the, and zero blues and that that gap that's right django and stefan stefan hated the blues Really? Well, oh, two things he really hated was anything bluesy. For instance, he thought Wes Montgomery was really boring. Didn't <laughs> and anything that was like one chord, pedal point. Yeah. Uh, very few people I played with. I did have a little play with Pat Metheny, and he's a bit like that. In other words, if it's a pedal point, for me, that's liberating. For them, sure. and for Capelli, it was like after four bar, he'd go, I don't know what to play now. Give me another chord. <laughs> <laughs> and when we played him, we played him some Aliat Barkan. And uh -huh. promoted, we had a very, very uh, sophisticated and and cultured promoter who promoted all sorts of music, including Aliat Barkan, Ravi Shankar, and and and, and Stefan said, "Oh, play me some of that Khan music. What is it? What is it?" So we put it on. It goes, and he goes, oh, "I like it more." Oh. Then after about thirty seconds, he goes, "There are no chords." <laughs> There is no chord. What's the point? Right. No chords. What's the point? This guy is deeply French. Yeah, deeply French, <laughs> deeply harmonic. You know, yeah, deeply harmonic. Well, that that's that's what it is. I mean, yeah. these cultures yeah. just uh, evolved yeah. so differently. It's it's pretty well, it's crazy. The, the French are very harmonic, and you think of Ravel and Debussy, mm -hmm. it's very harmonic. Yeah, there's always there's always motion, and there's always you know, yeah, just two layers two layers of melody. Yes, that's right. That's, that's a very good point, actually, Danny. That's absolutely right. His friends, yeah, yeah. He really, he really couldn't stand it. He'd take it off. He give me. They have this expression when you're fed up. Give me. And <laughs> I'll take it off. He give me the barb. <laughs> so Ali Akbar Khan in the bin. Oh, um, all, dude. All well, I can I can really relate. I relate to that to an extent because I do find that music that like you know has that thing but doesn't build intensity i can't take but i think that the real thing we always say this uh, there's a conversation that i've had a few times about archetypes in jazz and the right. kinds the kinds of musicians that have happened and if you take a look at like the first kind of musician that there was you know the louis armstrong guy who's mm -hmm. like the entertainer right, right. It's just like is playing you know 
cute things and per- like perfect and happy and just like with such a distinct f- face okay. on them. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna, yeah. uh, okay. And, and then to, to me, like the second kind was the Charlie Parker and the Django that were more like, you know, taking on, elevating it out of entertainment into like being a classical virtuoso type. Okay. It's okay. just like shredding through it. And then okay. the Coltrane was like the third kind of guy who took it the spiritual route and like, you know, went into like, you know, reach some sort of musical ecstasy. And then you had people like yourself and Holdsworth and Matheny that was, it was more like the end of history. There was already a look, a looking (laughs) back the Obamas of, uh, of, of music. I don't know what I, (laughs) but but I'm saying. It's interesting what you say about the end of history in the sense that we weren't historical. No, start. no, it, it, it's a part because now it's now it now it's it's eating itself. But it was it was it was summing it was summing up everybody. Yes, I think that's you, right. I think in a way that's true. But I I would take issue with what you said about Louis Armstrong. But I know what you're saying, um, um, and I I agree actually. As you carried on, I agreed more because you know early Louis Armstrong is is musical music making of the highest order. Oh no! I think it's the best. I mean, that that's actually yeah. my favorite kind of yeah. jazz. Uh, incredible! I mean, those solos. Well, they're just I nobody mean, plays solos better than that. Really, there's it's something. Helped. The the desire is so clear. Yeah. To play the best, like yeah. I mean, enter- I don't mean entertainment in like Backstreet Boys kind of fashion. Oh, right. I mean, it's like like actual stuff that you know. That's the kind of lines that would just work the best. Like, you know, there's, uh, I mean, I would say like Charlie Parker, who I'm a huge fan of. I, it's not entertaining. It's, it's like enchanting or like, you know, I see. It, but like, it's like, it, it's, right. it's overwhelming to listen to somebody play that great. Right. But it's okay. like, it, like Louis Armstrong to me plays in a way that it, 100% of what he's playing gets absorbed. You know, well, exactly. Exactly, and I see what I see what you mean in that sense. You're using enter- entertaining, perhaps not the right word, in, at the highest level because everybody can absorb Louis Armstrong. Yeah, if you've got open ears. It doesn't matter if you know jazz or not. You can listen to Louis Armstrong, and to me, this is this is still actually a bit of a benchmark because I imagine the ideal listener as being somebody who's has. Great ears, is really open and responsive to music. Now, if they hear Louis Armstrong, they will go, ah, oh, I hear mm-hmm. that. And I think they will with Charlie Parker. But, you know, some people of a slightly lesser character, they, a lesser Louis Armstrong or a lesser Stan Getz, mm-hmm. can, still, can still give the listener something. But a lesser Coltrane, I'm afraid, yeah. Some, who just copies the notes rather than what you're talking about, the feeling, or somebody who doesn't have the same feeling but just copies the notes, that to an ordinary listener is pretty not very attractive. And it's no. quite understanding that people don't, understandable, that people don't really want to hear it. But if you play and also it depends which Coltrane you're talking about. I mean, I was just playing, interestingly enough, it came up on something I was listening to. It's Red Garland Trio with... Billy's Bounce, 1958. It's about mm-hmm. that, and he he uh, yeah he double doubles it. You know, it's a normal what normally people would play. You know, and he's going. Mm-hmm. He goes all the way through, and I thought, okay, the the I'm not taking issue with any of it, but it is interesting how he has decided to do that as a mm-hmm. concert. I am going to double this tempo all the way through. So it's like an out of the head intellectual decision which he's made. And, you know, to me, it's breathtaking. But to a listener, whereas before that, I had this whole Stan Getz thing that I was playing in my car, like hours and hours of Stan Getz. And I mean, that is, you know, everybody loves Stan Getz. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've met one or two people in my life who say, I'm not Stan Getz. And I reflect more on them than it does on Stan Getz. Because... He's going for it. He's, go- he's going for, for beauty. He is going for beauty. One of the things about him, that just these things just occur to me when I listen carefully, which I don't often do, but I, I have been doing that. 
is that actually he doesn't have an axe to grind. He wouldn't go, right, I can see if I can double the tempo all the way through. He would never do that. Mm-mm. He actually nearly always plays at the tempo of the song. And if it's really fast, he just plays through it as if it's nothing. Mm-hmm. And if it's medium, he plays through it. And his lines at a high speed, you could slow them down, and they're as perfect as his, as his lines at medium speed. Mm-hmm. So... I mean, I don't compare people like that. You can't compare Coltrane and Getz because they're in different worlds. But that's very different worlds. And, and, and but I, but you do bring up a very good point about you know the rhythmic choices that people get, and right. that people that that you know that people do choose yeah. are choices that probably affect your style more than anything. And I think listening to Coltrane, we, uh, I'll preface this this by saying that the way you know, I think about rhythm is that you always have the choice of whether you're going to ride the groove or yes. make a statement. Exactly. And ri- and riding the groove is, you know, has to do with playing the same kind of subdivision that's being divided yeah. with, with the drummer, with the cymbals. Exactly. And when you hear Coltrane playing with, with, you know, like up against the wall or something, he's playing yeah, yeah. those kind of things. It's always a, like, you know, Elvin Jones is kind of swinging and Coltrane's yeah. playing very straight on it. Yeah. Even when they're playing the same kind of subdivision, there's yeah, always yeah. the tension of yeah, the straight right. eighth notes against the swung eighth exactly. notes. Exactly. And it's just, I think, this desire to always be a focal point right. rather than yeah. being just... A shade in the painting, you know. It's right. Okay. 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 Yeah. You know, okay. So that, like, I, it's, it makes, it makes your playing not as embedded in the picture. And I think some people just organically, the way they see themselves inside music is more one of the guys, and then some people yeah. see themselves a mile ahead. You know, yeah. it's like you, like a Stevie Ray Vaughan kind. It's like people who dress up. You know, it's just the, it, it's the kind of characters that really enjoy popping out, you know? Right. Would you say Stan Getz sees himself miles ahead? Well, I would say Stan Getz just sees himself, uh, like, inside the music. I think he makes, like, uh, like aesthetic choices. He's kind of, like, more embedded in the picture, whereas Coltrane is right in your face, barking at you. Right, okay. He's certainly doing that. He's certainly doing that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But interesting enough, of course, um, you know, psychologically, he would see himself as more involved. Mm-hmm. Stan Getz would see himself as a free individual uh, moving between rhythm sections and making his Stan Getz thing. Whereas right. Coltrane would see himself psychologically as part of the band, as part of the process. So in a way, you're saying, although that's how he sees himself, he's coming across as something else. I, w- I would think so. I mean... T- yeah. At, at the end of the day, Coltrane has the you. You're the one of one of the few people that was really in a band in jazz. You know, most people well, weren't able to maintain no, bands. Right. right. Well, you funny you should say that because I feel that actually, apart from, I, I, I wasn't really. And that when I see these bands, so particularly the bands of my era, like Pink Floyd, Genesis, and mainly middle class boys who knew how to get together and work towards a common cause. Mm-hmm. And although I was in the soft machine, I have to say that in the 70s, the atmosphere in the soft machine was pretty poor. And there was a lot of... But then I think the atmosphere in those Pink Floyd-type bands and Genesis bands was probably pretty bad. But mm-hmm. they were able to sort of survive somehow mm-hmm. uh, and, and work as a group. But you're right, I was in the soft machine. And I still am, obviously. Mm-hmm. But after that, it became, and in fact, that's an interesting point because it was a great shock to me to be in the jazz world where there was no loyalty. And mm-hmm. no, I mean, it was, I was, I was devastated at the beginning because I thought, hang on, what's going on? You know, and then I realized, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a gun and they're a gun and they're a gun and we pop up and play together and don't play together. So I'm kind of used to that now. But in the early days, I found it very wounding because you, You'd play with somebody, and then they'd be playing with somebody else the next day. And you go, well, "I thought you were with me, man." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you. I thought I was. Uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, and then you realise it's nothing personal. It's just the way the, the kind of the way the business is. And and so I did. You're right, actually. Up until the end of 
Dr. Machine, really, or the Grappelli thing, I did feel like I was in band. Yeah, so, I mean, I, the, the group, problem... Part of a group. The problem with that thing is that you don't get to grow your sound. You just get to have a lot of different sounds. And, I just, you know, you get to grow or, or you make music that's very, like, you know, I don't know, self, like, it's your evolution. It's, it, you know, it's not, well, there's you, something that so happens in bands. Exactly. Some, I'm, yeah, I think, yeah, exactly right. I, I thought yeah, I got the wrong end of the stick, what you're saying. I something in happening in bands where you i mean god and particularly in the 60s i mean why is the beatles album first album so great why is this even the first stones album is absolutely sure. great rocking clapton with males blues breakers why because they played that material for a year up and down the motorways playing eight and they're going to record it's just like press the button and and we're off yeah and although I mean, the, the Blues Breakers album particularly, um, we were a bit disappointed that it wasn't as good as the live show. Now, when you play it, you go, wow. And that that was pretty representative, actually. I mean, they didn't quite get, because nobody knew how to record an overdrive guitar sound. Mm -hmm. He was the first one trying to do it. And thank God they tried to make him turn down. And in those days, he was bullshit. He said, no, I'm not turning down. So they had to work out a way of recording him with him playing that loud. And which wasn't very loud. It's only a 45 watt Marshall. But for them, you know. In those days, they, yeah. Well, they, you they didn't have dynamic their, microphones. Really. Exactly. And they had their <laughs> bowler hats on their pinstripe suits. They go, no, no, no. You're, you're in our studio. You're not allowed to play that loud in our studio. We're making our meters go like this. You know? <laughs> and luckily, he, he refused to turn down. And... Because, funny enough, if you listen to the next album, which is Hard Road with Peter Green, mm -hmm. who obviously started off as a kind of Clapton imitator, but developed his own thing, they've got him to turn down. He's not, he's, his sound is not as powerful as it was live, whereas Eric went, I'm doing it. I'm bloody yeah. doing it. So they hadn't, you know, Hard Road was probably, you know, nine months later than the Bruce Bay. So they're still in their suits. They go, turn it down. And old Peter Green probably went, mm, all right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but also, he had a Marshall 100. Yeah. Because I saw them pretty soon. Because we, we followed them around everywhere. So poor old Peter, you know, when he came on first, well, we want Eric, we want Eric. <laughs> <laughs> he would have had a Marshall 100 at that time. He later, later had a box when he got his really distinctive sound. But a Marshall 100. And they would have not allowed that to be turned up to a decent level. So he, he so so anyway, what was the, what was the point of that? <laughs> I well, I mean, the, were we were talking about bands and how they developed bands. distinct sounds. Exactly. So they got that sound from just mm -hmm. playing together, or like Beatles just got that sound. It wasn't like you know, if you hear the mel melding of the Beatles sound on the early mm -hmm. couple of albums. It's so together. Whereas you take the individual guys. I mean, there was this thing on Buddy Facebook with Quincy Jones slagging off Ringo Starr. How dare he? Right. Off Paul McCartney. Give us a break. You know. Dude, that guy's um, great. They were, they were fantastic. I mean, Ringo and, and I mean, Ringo's drumming is just perfect for the Beatles because it's yeah. behind the beat. And however busy, his time is wonderful. And, you know, so the whole thing gels together. That's the point. And it's not the gelling you get where you get four really good musicians who know how to mm -hmm. read know how to play. It's the gelling of people who've been together, been in a band. It's like the Count Basie Orchestra or the Duke Ellington thing. They've been in a fucking tour bus forever. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they well, the idea, it. there's the silly idea that's floating around that like if you get a Dave Weckl or a Vinnie Cagliuta on any record, it's going to be better, which yeah. is like, Right. And and right. yeah, it's it's right. it's insanity because yeah. you know I was talking to Steve Rodby, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. played, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. he he did all the editing on the Matheny records, which is right. a lot of editing. Like those right. those those records are heavily edited, especially the digital ones. When they were doing yeah. tape, he was showing me these books where he would sl like with a razor just cut tape and yeah. paste like the thing to just fix parts. But he had the most interesting thing to say about uh, what he considered the pocket in recording, 
right? Because okay. you because now you get to line up all the waveforms, yeah, and right. he called it the Japanese sound when you just yeah. do it on the sample where everything's like yeah, absolutely exactly. together. Yeah. So you gotta let things dance around, but. Yeah. The, the thing is, like, what sort of range are you playing with? And this is the thing that's so dumbfounding, is that if you take a Dennis Chambers-type player yeah. and you let him into Tom Waits's band, it's mm. not going to work. No, but not, if you no. take Tom Waits's drummer and let him play behind Michael Brecker, it's, always, it's also not going to work. No, so no. it's like, you got, it's, it's this game of adjusting the size of the basketball to the size of yeah. the hoop. Exactly. And, exactly. And, and it's like loose things kind of have yeah. their own gelling yeah. thing and their own sway. Yeah. And the thing that like a guy who plays very surgical can just jump into any musical situation yeah, exactly. and rock it exactly. is insane. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the idea of, as, of uh, what, as you say, it's almost like the, the sort of, uh, um, it, it's a horrible idea came to my mind you're describing it as like, so instead of lining up the waveforms, they have a built-in imperfection thing, which they probably do, mm -hmm. to make it appear to be more organic, you know. And, yeah. Uh, well, of course, in my day, you see, you see, it, interesting, it just a similar and simple example is click tracks. Click tracks didn't come in till I think, probably mid-70s. Mm -hmm. Before people started playing to click How tracks. do you feel about them? Well, I, I'm used to it. I mean, I had a... Quite a, a period, never, not very deep, but uh, uh, 50, 15 years when I was doing quite a lot of sessions. Mm -hmm. And you get used to click tracks. And also, funnily enough, I was also saying on this little interview I was doing earlier about, um, you know, when I, you see, there's so many things we did when we started because there was nobody to, to refer to. I was practicing, I used to practice my scales and stuff without a metronome. Mm. So I, I, I got in a terrible habit of speeding up and things. Yeah. So, so the thing about Click is you got, I got used to it. Now, but I never, I mean, we'd never do a soft machine album with a Click. Out of the question. And that's never? Really? Never. We've never done any of those. Ah, oh, now, hang on. When we did the softs in 75, 76, no, we didn't have a Click. No, I don't think so. I remember doing uh, that part to Tales of Taliesin, and I did it on guitar. Bo -do 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 and I remember I could, I've got a, a, an auditory visual image of me overdubbing that line, mm -hmm. and there wasn't a click. No, I was playing along to Carl Jenkins and Marshall and Babington, who hadn't played to a click. So there was no click there. I don't think any Soft Machine album was done to a click. And certainly our albums now, Hidden details, no, 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 click, no, it's not allowed. Well, Marshall won't have it, and quite rightly. But I find, of course, it's very useful. I mean, it's oh, yeah, useful. the um, idea of just being like able to click. mix and your takes, exactly, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's like, I, I want that lick, <laughs> uh, I, absolutely. And, 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 um, you know, we, we record our albums in a very rudimentary, old fashioned way, which uh, suits our music because it's kind of got that <laughs> do you mean an old-fashioned strategy of recording or tape yes old-fashioned strategy. No, no, no no yeah no, no. okay old-fashioned strategy you know yeah we play live in the studio mm -hmm. we've got separation mm -hmm. by and large the takes will be as live but there is separation so you can do drop-ins and things but we certainly can't go from you know, you can't say, well, well the, the, you, we, so we got five takes done to a click, so I'll take and put my solo on to take four. and. Uh, yeah, that's not going to line up. No, no, no. Yeah. But of course, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's actually very useful if you do play. Together. And of course, if you, going back to your waveform thing, I've seen, you know, genius session players who can play to a click and make it seem like they're really playing rubato. Mm-hmm. Or, or they're moving in and around the click. You know, there's a, I remember watching this genius piano player called Dave Hartley, who played on Leaving Las Vegas. And he was doing, he was playing to a click, playing a solo piece to a click, and he was moving around in it. Of course, nobody stopped him and said, oh, you're getting behind the <laughs> But they knew what he was doing. And it was, that's great. Yeah. So there again, to play, to, to try and, keep what you're talking about the the movement with a click that's that's 
something. Well, it's it's the thing about, I mean, a, a thought that keeps reoccurring to me when I think about time, and when I think about classical music, yeah, uh, uh, European classical music, how is well, two things, but the first of them is how obscene time in itself used to be regarded as as an aesthetic inside music. Like they had a dude <laughs> that would mime time, you know, yeah, for, time. For, exactly. for, for the orchestra because they didn't yeah. want anybody to beat it on anything. And then we had exactly. somehow like drum sets became a thing, which is so mind boggling to me that like you have like a bass drum tuned to an audible pitch, like an F when you're playing a song yeah. in E. And yeah, we exactly. somehow all just have this cognitive ability to push it out of the picture. I know, I know. It's, I, it's, it's bizarre. The drum set is mind blowing. I mean, so what, what a strange instrument. It's real. <laughs> I mean, sometimes my ears go like that, and I think, what is this weird, aggressive, clattering military? Yeah, how are we thing? expect? How are we accepting this? You yeah, know what I, I mean? Know. It's like he's just right. playing like an like I trained my whole life to hear the modes on the chord and somebody's just bl banging a flat two on a I major know, seven know. chord. <laughs> I know, I know it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. Uh, I mean, I do really think that sometimes. And I don't know about you, but so often when I, so many gigs I do and I think, God, thank God there's no drummer here. Yeah. You know, oh you yeah. Know, I, mean, I do love drummers. Sorry, sorry, any drummers listening. I mean, I do. No, no, fuck them. Let's, let's have them have it once. Let's fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's certain things I love to do, like say the soft the way I play in the soft machine. That couldn't possibly happen without drums, because you need that kind of thing to well, get you going. That, but, that's you know, it's interesting you say that, yeah. But, but every most so many, if I go into a, you know, play a, a duo with somebody in a little church or something, and I think, well, oh thank God we haven't, you know, an occasion no. I've booked a drummer or or I've been in a band which has a drummer, and we're in a church. And it's just a nightmare, you know, and you're going, and it's, it's just such an unspiritual sound. And particularly the kit itself. The mm -hmm. something it's very I aggressive. Really it's very it. aggressive. Very well, aggressive. And then I mean, back beat one. Gah! Gah! And you're going, look, mate, you're, it's like you're somebody's chopping a wood. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when you're playing jazz gigs and you're, you're playing with a jazz drummer, to yeah. me, it, it, it occurred to me especially if you're playing an arch top type thing yeah. that most drummers hate, like not, not actively hate guitar, but don't explore. Like I, I, it, it just occurred to me that like, you know, the way they're playing, it's as if you are a horn player, but like they never really checked out a West Montgomery record to see yeah. how to support the sound of, okay. of an arch top okay. guitar in a beautiful way. If you don't oh. play drums the same way, if you're playing okay. behind a guy playing an L5, it's no, not the same. Right. You can't just go Coltrane. You'll bury the guy. I, I would very rarely take something like an L5 out on a gig where there's a drummer. Because, yeah. You know, you're actually tipping me to something that I haven't consciously thought, but that's basically it. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, there's a way to play behind it. And you assume yeah. a lot of times that the jazz drummer has, has listened to the vocabulary of music, but most drummers don't really give a fuck about Wes Montgomery. They listen no, to yeah. Coltrane. Yeah. They listen to piano trios and Coltrane. So it's either they're playing Jones. too soft or, or too loud. Yeah. Elvis. They all want to be it, Elvis. Yeah. No, but the one thing that I will say though, I had um, uh, Gary Husband for a talk on this thing and he was talking about Holdsworth and he was saying something that I that was mind blowing to me because I d I had the same experience with my drummer, which because I play a half stack, and right. my drummer showed up to the gig with a bebop kit in the beginning and it was like you're gonna have to get a big drum set and he said that Holdsworth made him go from a bebop kit to a big drum set and also John McLaughlin did the same thing in Ma Vishnu. Made him get a big kit. Made made him get the big yeah, kit. That, that, that's yeah, that's right. So, so it's like the size of the drums have to somehow match the size of the amp. But the air... Right. You know, I, I certainly couldn't... You know, one of the reasons why I love playing in the soft machine, which is my favorite thing. You know, I've got lots of things that I do. And I kind of enjoy them all. But when I do that um, soft machine, we played at the Jazz Cafe the other day. And, and the singer I work with, a wonderful singer, and she came down and she said... Now I see what you really are. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, because I mean, that's A, my roots, it's where I came from, it's where if I made any kind of 
contribution, which I wouldn't claim to do, but I certainly, you know, in the early 70s, there I was, me and, and, and you know, a, a few others like Alan and Ollie Helsall and, and people do, trying to do this, or, well, they were great, you know, but I mean, doing this sort of, it was really for me putting together Django Reinhardt and Eric Clapton, if you like, or mm -hmm. a bit of Hendrix, you know, that's what, in a way, all through the 60s and the late 60s, I was trying to do. So when I heard John McLaughlin's extrapolation, that blew me away. Not because of particularly the guitar technique, which is quite rough, but because he was like, it was the approach. It was like jazz with balls, you know. Yeah, it was the energy. I, I, yeah, jazz it was... with energy. Because I love Wes, but, you know, the whole Tal Farlow, Jimmy Rainey thing, it's great. But, you know, when I heard that, it was like, ah. Oh, because I'd gone right off jazz and into Clapton and Hendrix and things, although I always loved Django. And then when I heard that, I thought, yeah, jazz with balls, right? And then I, sort of really trying to put it together into what you'd call a sort of proto-fusion style. And of course, everybody, there were lots of other people trying, kind of trying to do this. So yeah. in a way, that, so playing with the soft machine sort of reconnects me with that early thing that I was doing. And, and also the thing about the drum kit, you know, it's got to be a drummer with a big kit. Yeah, and or you can't you, turn up. You feel no, you, you can't turn up a Marshall like that. Or you're gonna feel so naked. <laughs> but and stay. back to your point, you don't want to be playing an L5 with a drummer with a big kit. You exactly. Really don't. You yeah, gotta match the does. aesthetic. But yeah, I mean, what you're bringing up. I mean, just to paraphrase it, the thing I always say is that a lot of classical music and a lot of jazz is more like being caressed or gently kissed. Yes. But fusion is the hardcore porn business of well, music. I know what you're saying, but, but I know it's just saying. it's an aggressive experience. Uh, yes, in some ways, although, <laughs> although, yeah, I, I, I. I mean, look at what you're yeah. doing to the people on the front row. Look at the experience you, you're. Well, it's not. That's true. It's that's true. It, you're it's going for you, you're yeah, going for true. their heads. I, I, you know, you're you're trying to tear heads off. I mean, I agree. I mean, you know, I'll admit that it's pretty. And I must say, when we play with the soft machine, and we don't, yeah, we have a massive audience. We get quite good audiences. It's mainly blokes. There yeah, are a few girls there, but it's mainly men. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and I don't actually want. You see, I, I, I kind of, in a way, I like my life on that level because, uh, you know, when I play with the soft machine, that's me reconnecting with my sort of teenage, early twenties testosterone blokey past if i play with vimler or something you know she's singing and and mm -hmm. you know i have to handle it that basically if you if you're playing a duo with a beautiful credibly gifted singer everybody's listening to the singer oh yeah that's what they're hooking into you are just you know and it's good for me you know it's good for me because i was a pretty poor accompanist and i think i've become a much better accompanist and um, we do a lot of duo work and, and you know, I recognise that everybody's hooked into her because she, and that's, I tell you, well, this is important, Danny, I think, she, uh, and it's been said a hundred times before, but I think we should all remember that we should try and be like vocalists, not them trying to be like us. So if you listen to Jeff Beck, mm -hmm. he is playing the guitar like a vocalist. Mm -hmm. And that's why he can get away. He's probably... You know, as soon, as soon as you don't have vocals, you know, your level of economic potential is right down. You have to say Jeff Beck is, well, of course, Jeff Beck is probably the most popular or highest earning pure instrumentalist in the world. I mean, that's not very big, but it's sure. big by instrumental standards. I mean, he can, he can, I don't even do the O2, but he could do uh, the Albert Hall. I, I, I agree with that, but I would say also that Jeff Beck is one of the greatest guitar players in the world at playing like a 45 second solo. But Jeff yes, Beck doesn't, no, doesn't have, have the rhythmic yeah. vocabulary and That's the right. technical intensity to sustain a three minute That's solo, right. whereas That's you do. So right. it's, no, a, it's, right. it's the amount of space that you, that you, you need to decorate. But do you know what? Do you know what? The, all these guys. I've known them and don't not know them. I've seen them since. I mean, they're all about four years older than me. I saw Jeff Beck's first gig with the Yardbirds. He was exactly the same, although it's changed the sound. Everything changed. Mm -hmm. He's a bit a bitty player. He's an as you say a forty-five second incidental player. Absolutely yeah. right. 
I absolutely agree with you. And the one because you you have to have vocabulary to 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 play yeah. long solos and keep them interesting. I know, and the 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 one who was really is a disappointment who who fell right off his Clapton. I mean, he he was amazing. And mm-hmm. one of the amazing things was his time, his flow, um, and and in blue in male he had ideas. And I think. I think he lost ideas because of Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce. I think that I think they just broke his heart with their warring, bashing. I mean, I think the Cream Live, the sound of the rhythm section is just horrible, and mm-hmm. he's got no chance. And I think it broke his heart. And if you listen to when he used to play Hideaway, I mean, that is a beautifully developed solo. And if you listen to the Stepping Out solo on the Blues Breakers album, it's you might say in note terms, it's simple music, but you listen to that solo, the development, the placing, the rhythmic placing of the notes, mm-hmm. it's absolutely superb. And, it, and mm-hmm. at the time, unprecedented. And he's 20 years old. So I agree. Jeff Beck, I love to listen to, but we all knew in 1965 that Beck was... In fact, the very first time I um, like say this on... On uh, Skype, I smoked cannabis. <laughs> Huey, Huey Flint, the drummer of John Mayles Blues Breakers in 1965. I wanted to get to near Eric, and I thought, well, I'll talk to Huey. He's probably more approachable. So he said, oh, my, I'm just going to go and have a smoke. Do you want to join me? And I'd never... <laughs> <laughs> we sat in the van, and do you know what? We talked about this, and I said, what about Jeff? He said, yeah, he said, Jeff. He said, Jeff's great, but he hasn't got the time like Eric, and it doesn't flow in the same way and that's that's true to this day yeah I mean, people are what they are yeah I, I absolutely take on board what you're saying i love jeff beck and he's not the person who can develop a solo he's not a <coughs> he's not a you know a, a lengthy solo builder mm-hmm. uh but um i i admire him very much for the for the for the fact that every note is approached like a singer would mm-hmm given a special character each note yeah i think i think there's something admirable about that for sure definitely i mean it's the opposite of say tal farlow Mm -hmm. where every note leads on to another note and the tone i mean it's almost laughable actually i have to say yeah no it's pretty bad it's pretty bad it's really i mean the bottom string it's like it's just like a pop yeah (laughs) (laughs) i mean it's it's face it you know i mean i'm not i'm gonna get into trouble I got into terrible trouble for saying something on the radio about Barney Kessel. And I love oh, Barney dear. Kessel. And I just said, I thought, you know, great, I love Barney Kessel. His technique was a bit rough, which I didn't mean as an uncompliment because, you know, I'm not ena- just enamored of people who've got immaculate techniques. Barney had a wonderful jazz sense and he was a wonderful musician of the 50s. Anyway, Maurice Summerfield came down on me like a ton of bricks. I you say that about Barney. <laughs> And I, I meant it as a compliment. He wasn't like fussy. You know, I, ne- I have to say, I was never very keen on the fussy players like Johnny Smith. You know, they're yeah. very good, but they're fussy. And Barney wasn't fussy. He was like going for it. Well, if you're, if you're going to be fussy, you've got to really pull it off. You've got to be a Benson or, yes, exactly. but no, you know. Barney just went for it. And it, sometimes it was just really sloppy. But I yeah. don't care. But anyway, I got into trouble. So, you know, anybody who loves Sal Farlow, I love Tal Farlow as well. But you do have to admit that the bottom note's going fuck, fuck, fuck. It's, uh, in this day and age, it's a little it's bit rough. Hard. The, it's the rough. tone is rough. It's a lot really of these rough. guys, a lot yeah. of these guys, um, you got to listen to them with a lot of compassion. You do. You know, because well, you time, yeah. times were yeah. different. Yeah, exactly. You listen to the, you don't have to listen to their notes, Seth Lang. I mean, Tal Farlow plays extraordinary notes because you remember that if you're playing that kind of speed where it's not a matter of playing scales, it's a matter of playing proper bebop lines. Yeah. But I mean, you know, yeah. And the thing is about those guys, because there was no guitar culture, they were just basically getting as near they could to imitate saxophone players. Yeah, that's all so they were trying they to did do. A bloody good job, but except for the tone, where, which they really didn't take any notice of at all. They didn't think about their tone. Well, what was available? Like even like I don't know. Like you broke a cable. What, like what? Where'd yeah. you where'd you get a cable? Yeah. <laughs> well, Wes had a tone because of the thumb. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, he did, and every and he kept every he kept things. I, I keep thinking about how complicated the world the world must have like if you think a hundred and fifty like how the fuck did Beethoven get those people 
to ride horseback, to rehearse. Like if you broke your bow, like the second violin, how bad yeah. must have orchestras sounded? People had the plague. <laughs> they would have sounded terrible. Of course they would have sounded terrible. And yeah, I'm saying it's like, how <laughs> to tune? It's like, where'd, where'd they get the violin? It's like, so you have no, to like go I mean, pluck yeah, a chord. Exactly. Uh, well, I mean, where's, you know, those first recordings where he's playing a 175 with P90. If he'd yeah. been playing that with a pick, that would have sounded awful. It oh, sounded horrible. 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 Really horrible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, I, I he's a, he's a freak. I mean, to think about that level of technique and that yeah. rhythm, like, and how he yeah. developed it. And he really is the only guy that, like, yeah, yeah. just left, come, came out of left field running, just invented the sound in jazz. And... Well, the thing was, he was old when he was discovered. So yeah. Unfortunately, he was mid 30s. So he developed it away on his own. And I, you know, well, you're an American, so you know this, but we can't conceive of this in this country. But in America, you can be doing something in your own little community, you know, and, and the rest of the world, i.e. America, can be completely unaware of it. Now, that doesn't mm -hmm. happen because we're small and London is so powerful. But if you're doing anything, uh, it's eventually quite soon going to come involve and London. But, I mean, he was in Indianapolis, you know, mm -hmm. and there he was playing away, you know, and developing this thing. And then... You know, you get to be <coughs> 34, and then Cannibal Adley or whoever was discovers him, and then he's off. Yeah, he's off. So, so he had the advantage of not having been overexposed when he was too young. So by the time he appeared, he was very mature. Yeah, burning. Burning, yeah. Burn, absolutely burning. Yeah. You know, and uh, and uh, I'd say probably his L5 with a pick wouldn't have sounded quite so bad, but his 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 the first recording guitar, the the P90 guitar. Uh, the way it sounds, it's quite fret buzzy as well. I mean, mm -hmm. it. yeah. I mean, when it, by the F, I mean the thing about playing with the thumb and playing with a lot of volume from your amp and a soft touch, it just allows yeah. you to get so close to the note exactly. in a way that, like, the pick would be. You get this like yeah. touching sound of the string yeah, that's exactly. kind of gross. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, I, I mean, to me, I mean, okay, his lines are great. He's extremely academically sound oh yeah people sort of there's some myth it's almost like a racist myth in guitar community it used to be that you know okay you know he's an uneducated man and he's sort of playing by instinct all that it's, it's really really well you know everything he does you can r transcribe and go yeah that's exactly well what the, the, there is something some disease it's it's a modern disease of the mind and I think it comes from people not understanding that, you know, this whole thing of playing a 10 minute solo on an E chord yes. is a brand new thing, right? <laughs> it's like, that's like, that's not where music, like this illusion when people study jazz now because they start from rock is right. like, okay, first of all, I'm gonna learn how to like play on like a Hendrix thing for yeah. 20 minutes and yeah. then I'll figure out what's going on. But it's like, this, this is a mid sixties phenomena. If you wanted to play with anybody, you had to play changes. There were no people in the twenties that didn't play changes. Exactly, right. <laughs> and they didn't play scales. No, they, they just play played that. out of, the, I mean, it's so uh, intuitive. Cool. You play the grips and then you play exactly. around the grips. Exactly. You played the grips <laughs> as lines. Yeah. You're absolutely right, Danny. It's absolutely true. When I used to do a lot of teaching, I thought, actually, our instrument, the guitar, is visually one of the easiest instruments to play changes on because you yeah. can see the chord and you play out the chord. Well, I mean, and, it's... And you so many guitarists, you come to you and they go, and then you go, and they, and they go, oh, I can't play changes too hard. You go, actually, that's really weird because what you're doing is actually the weirdest thing on guitar because it's not natural to the guitar. Absolutely. And playing out the chords, I mean, Eddie Lang, who the, the earliest soloist in what we call straight jazz, um, his solos are just coming out of the arpeggios. They're just picking out the arpeggios. That's, well, I mean, Wes, too. The grips he's yeah. playing comping That's are right. the grips That's he's right. playing soloing. Exactly. He's playing exactly. the same things. Exactly. And then so, everything else is a passing note. Yeah. And, and, it's, and, it, and the that's the thing. I mean, it's like with piano, it's like, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's right there with the fretboard, too. Yeah. It's there for us. Whereas for a horn player, um, and you know, guitarists will go, yeah, but saxophone player, they can play changes because actually, no, it's difficult. They can't see anything. 
Yeah. And I'll tell you a little story about that, which is that exactly illustrates what you're saying. 19, so I started, you know, by the time I got into a bit of, I was doing, I had a book of scales, I was doing scales and this, and I'm practicing my scales every day. We're talking about 68, 69, 67, you know, I've got my book of scales and I'm doing my scales and all that. And in about 1972, I bought um, Kind of Blue. Mm. And the liner note said, and this revolutionary concept of playing scales. I'm going, <laughs> what? Revolutionary concept of playing scales. I hadn't figured out by then that, that it was all chord tones up until then. And of course, then I realized, you know, yes, in fact, you, as you're saying, you know, people start with scales and then they go, oh, God, change. <laughs> You know? <laughs> well, I mean, the music, but the music they grow up with is so harmonically poor. There's a yeah. there's a real degradation of yeah. generations in, in play. Like when you hear the Beatles, it's like, yeah, they're writing slightly simpler songs than Cole Porter. But, but in their well, ear, there's Beethoven, there's Cole Porter, yeah. there's show tunes, yeah. there's a lot of things. Yeah. But the people that grow up on the Beatles already yeah. have well, one yeah. layer less. Yeah. And the and people that grow up on right. those people. That's right. And like right now, I mean, if you're growing up and what you hear on the radio is Rihanna, like yeah. I don't know how you're gonna figure out changes. It's no, probably I, so foreign for them to hear like a minor two five one. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I suppose what's happened, and it, 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 you know, the first time I noticed it was like say with Graceland in 1985. I thought these songs are nothing like what he wrote back in the day. They don't have the but what they've got is great production values, a fantastic mm -hmm. recorded sound, great groove, you know, and that's what you've got since since the eighties. You've got immaculate grooves, mm -hmm. you know, all and 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 I mean I I don't want to pontificate on this because I'm an old geezer, you know. Sounds like an old fart. Going, oh, they don't write shit like this in my day. Oh, I don't think. <laughs> It's the classic. It's the classic complaint. But it does sound like shit. <laughs> yes, it does. It does. But the point is, it's the values. It's the values that have changed. Of course, you know, all the grooves are now immaculate. I mean, you can you can find so-called groovy records from the sixties and seventies where the groove is like, you go, you call that a groove? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid the time is a bit wobbly on that groove. But you know, get that thing about click tracks. I mean. I love it listening to old sixties and early seventies records, and you can hear things speeding up, slowing down, and and uh, we nobody bothered, nobody worried at the time. And you have to think, actually, what in the final analysis do people come back to in music? And it, to me, it comes back to the first thing we we're talking about, Lou Armstrong. Mm -hmm. You hear something, you know. We spend all this time trying to make sure our albums have an immaculate sound, sort of profile or whatever. Now, I, I remember doing some, hot, I've done a lot, a lot of hot club library stuff. Like, you know what I mean by library music? Stuff that yep. gets played on television. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of that, I got, I got one company sort of, <coughs> for years, had me as their sort of hot club guy. And so we used to do a 30th mix. Mm. So we, we do a, a, a full profile, full mix, and then we do a 30th mix, uh, which squashes everything down, makes the guitar sound fantastic. You know, if you really want to sound like Django, do a 30th mix. So, you know, you're going from about 8K to 14K, and that's it. Right. Or whatever, whatever it hurts. So, you know, so there it just is. It sounded like somebody had a pocket recorder in the yeah. audience. So, so <laughs> you know, what comes over great is guitar, Billy Holiday's type voice, trumpet. These are why these instruments, and, and the guitar comes over great. Because mm -hmm. it goes, like it yeah. does on YouTube. Right. Anyway, so... We do that, and you know what? Your ears would go, oh, what? And then within 30 seconds, you've adapted. Mm. You've adapted to that sound, and that sound sounds perfectly okay to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's the same thing with the 60s and 70s recordings, you know. You, you have go, to be in, you have to participate in the aesthetic. Yeah, and then you, <laughs> it doesn't bother you anymore. So You're right. You click track. You go back and you hear the time on some of those, some of those sort of, particularly the sort of between 60s, 1967 and 74, 75, when people were taking a lot of drugs and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you things hear, are extra sloppy. And, and course, extra sloppy. And the, the other great thing, of course, is production values. You completely change the mixes you get, because in those days, 
I mean, it, yeah, things were mixed on the fly. That's <laughs> right. You all stood by your fader. That's your guitar fader, and you're trying to edge it up when nobody's looking. <laughs> that would be funny. So it will be chalked out where you're meant to go, and you just go just a bit over there. That get me. Then somebody go. The guitar sounds a bit loud. You go. Does it? Oh, we're well, going to do another one. <laughs> <laughs> so you hear the most. If you listen to the seventies pop music, you hear those extraordinary mixes. Yeah. Sometimes you even hear musical mistakes. It's wonderful. I love it. It's just lovable. It's just something happened, though. I mean, when, when what we were talking about how generations grow up differently, I could see how when you start conflating the terms uh, accuracy and perfection, yes, exactly. you know, you you get into some tricky waters where you stop getting the point, right? Because exactly. life, life doesn't all beat, like, exactly. you know, in sync and not, like to where the entire band falls in step Absolutely. on the sample. You know, that's exactly. just, it's, it's creating the music of machines. But I think yeah. we're, it's, it's very, a thing that, <laughs> that crosses my mind that I still don't understand. I don't have a good musicological, um, you know, reason as to why it happened is the strange death of the swing groove like how uh, did, yes like how did it switch how did it switch not not like I, I, people still play swing i get it yeah, but, but it was the default like for cole in cole porter and irving berlin's mind everything had to swing ev it was it was when you wrote when you wrote changes it was over this in this like implicit groove that was swing <laughs> and it swing was everywhere and then it just right stopped and still a lot a lot of Beatles stuff is triplety there's swing and there's you know a lot of their songs are swing based uh like in the sense of like you know their shuffles or whatever but but in pop it just triplets kind of went away that's true triplets went away but also I feel that uh swinging itself as a concept went away now I have to admit myself I never really all the years I was learning all this, you know, bebop stuff or whatever I was doing or trying to absorb this or the other. I never really thought about swinging, you know, and, and that's real because, you know, uh, by, by my generation, it's really, I suppose, the bass, the jazz bass is Coltrane or something. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, but Elvin does swing, but we didn't, we didn't concentrate on that. And when I started playing with people like John Marshall and Robert Soft Machine, these guys were the kings of British jazz. That wasn't talked about, you know. No. Time was talked about time, you know, and, and um, but not swinging. Mm -hmm. And then, and then uh, with Grappelli, we were touring with Grappelli, and we had a young bass player called Brian Torf, great player. Uh, he was about to, at the time I was about twenty-eight. He was about twenty-four. And we were real pals and we used to practice together for hours, you know, and he was like a Niels Pedersen bass player. And then one day he put in Milt, he had, a, he had to death it out and he put in Milt Hinton, who was the guy who played with Charlie Christian in Minton's mm. in the 1940s, played with Parker. He was actually pre-bebop bass player, swing bass player. Came along, picked up his bass and he had rotten old strings on and his tuning wasn't great, but it swung like the clappers. And we're all going, bloody hell, you know. I mean, we love yeah. him. He's a brilliant player, and Brian was a brilliant soloist and everything, but this it just went it had the thing. Yeah. It had the thing. And it's you know, this is a generational thing. Generation. Yeah, no, most people now swing like a dick on a statue. <laughs> so it's us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I uh, myself included. And, and, and the point is, before, um, you know, that previous lot, Crepelli and that lot, they, that was it. The swing was the basis. Yeah. And we kind of lost that. And, of course, it, it, it really should, should be, the, you know, whatever you're doing, that should be the basis. And, and um, you know, we're swing. Yeah. Perhaps oh, hard. Farlow, perhaps Tal Farlow doesn't. I don't know. Perhaps he doesn't. My dad, that not, as, not nearly as hard. My, my dad was a Teddy Wilson pianist. He mm. played like Teddy Wilson. Every time I hear Teddy Wilson, I, I want to cry because it sounds like my dad. And he was relentless in his criticism of people like that. I played him some Tal Farley. He said, don't <laughs> play, play too many notes and it doesn't swing. 
you know, yeah. was the question, doesn't swing, old boy? I go, oh, right, okay. Then I came <laughs> Charlie, he said, you should listen to Charlie Christian. And he played from Charlie Christian, he goes, that swings, see? So it's actually, and I've, I'm guilty, I'm really guilty of this, uh, because I just, it was never, you know, I was always wanting to play loads of notes, and I wanted to be this, and I wanted to be that, and wanted to understand all the harmony, and wanted to do this. But didn't think enough about actually. Swing. Well, I mean, I think I think in a sense it's it's about what you're connected to, and I think swing like to me, Louis Armstrong is probably the best example yeah. of somebody who swings the hardest possible. Yeah. It's yeah. like it's this sensation that like they're just no matter how they place a note it absolutely works it's exactly. like there's there's like the, there's like two layers of it there's like first of all like the rhythm section part of it which tends yeah. to be just simple oh. you yeah. know and oh. and 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 i think really the thing about and i would say that coltrane's band swings much less than louis armstrong's band i think yeah. that's pretty safe to say yeah. and i think it has to do with contrast and when you're yeah. playing rhythmically rhythmically defined roles that are simple and predictable exactly. then you can allow contrast and interplay between exactly. a soloist and a band exactly, exactly. and i mean the, the the swingingest saxophone player to me is lester young oh and yeah of course it relies on the rhythm section being absolutely on the top of the beat chunk, 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 chunk. then you can cruise slightly behind the beat and exactly. play and when you play an off beat I got, 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 get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. they're on the beat you're off the beat if they go with you like people oh know, it's the, it's then... the worst <laughs> that's that <laughs> that that and double timing are yeah, the, double like the two things that make I hate double timing. I, hate I, I, I wanna, I wanna, it, it's like the only thing in my life that makes turns on the murderous switch that yeah, I yeah. wanna kill people. Double I just literally wanna du double timing anything when it's not like an arrangement. Yeah. It's like, dude, it's like, it's just, it just makes whatever I'm doing sound bad. Like, exactly. you know, it's, it's, it's awful. <laughs> Mickey I mean, Mouse thing, just like running what? around you. <laughs> Yeah, you know, in British jazz, it was a tradition that you don't say anything to anybody. You know, you don't, you know, in it's the a casual, horrible tradition. That's, casual, that's very... No, 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 but obviously <laughs> if you're in a band, but in the casual world. So I remember one of the first jazz jazz I ever did, and the guy on bass, Phil Bates, I said, look, you know, when I double the tempo, please don't double the tempo. He went, oh, oh. I didn't realise coming from rock bands that you didn't say anything to anybody. I, and he went, oh, well, I don't feel like playing now. I don't know what, ooh. He was really upset. But I felt it so strongly, you know. You don't have to yeah. go with you. No, 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 no. No, the whole point is contrast. The whole point is you stay where yeah. you are. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That's that. That's the. Th I mean, I think it's uh, it's kind of like an equal rights thing that like. Because yes. everybody is everybody is like uh, it's a generation of yes. correcting historic injustices, so all the drummers and bassists are trying to jump on board. <laughs> I have to say, and, and uh, I, I say this with all respect, political correctness. About the same time that female emancipation started happening, the rhythm section started getting emancipated. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, like, like they really like the line has to be drawn with bassists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if you're they, there, if, yeah. if somebody if somebody does not deserve equal rights, it's them. Because if you're gonna <laughs> if you're gonna choose that instrument, you know, it's it's a hard it's a tragic choice every time. I think. And well, <laughs> I mean, some. I mean, come on. They're they're no, playing. No, I, I love them. They're important. But it's also important that they understand the history and, and no, the hang, role. Hang on, Danny. I have to <laughs> say exception because actually I think the bass players are the, the heroes. Oh. Because they agree to take a role that doesn't draw attention to themselves. If they're good bass players, they're not always looking to get the limelight. They are the linchpin, actually, even more, more than the drummer, really. The linchpin is a good bass player. Your band, however well you're playing, if the bass player's sad, it's not going to make you sound good, right? That's true. And I, so they, they are really giving people, in fact, I always give, quite often give a little speech to, to, to about who you should marry in the band. 
Don't marry the violin player or the guitar player, but marry the bass player because he's no he knows how to be supportive. Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't play too many notes if he's a bass player. Yeah. And uh, there was a whole generation of there used to be a, there was a whole generation of And he's not he's not <laughs> he's not gonna have to deal with any temptation on the road. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well I'm that. joking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, no, I, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think actually bass players, uh, if they play proper bass, uh, are very heroic because it, it's it's like uh, you know, and and really the nicest people I've, I've known in music have been bass players because it's a it's something where you actually are giving for the whole band. You know, we're out there going, yeah, look at me, you know, and they're going, you know. But of course, if they get jealous and go, well, I want to be looked at as well, and then you get bass players, and I know plenty of them. Who are absolutely amazing, and they, they don't get books, and they go, "How come nobody books me? I'm I'm fantastic." And you go, "You are," but actually, people don't want that from a bass player. <laughs> it's great. I was. Ta- be, you better start playing guitar or saxophone or something, you know, because actually they don't want that. No, no, I mean the bass players you like playing with, the bass players you like playing with, the ones that have great time, and uh, don't want aren't angling for a solo all the time I'm well i mean it's it's a different like talking with jo- jokes aside the job of of a person like that is to frame and yes. and 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 it's and and he needs to be so focused and so in tune with what you're doing to to provide i mean great paintings need great fra- need great frames you know it's it, it's it's the truth and yeah. and it's a hard job but yeah, I mean, what's happening now, if you listen to music coming out of New York City, the kind of thing that's happening in the last 10 years with drummers and bassists, like with this emergence of this, these styles of music where it's just nonstop, like, you know, interaction. And I mean, I don't know. I, I honestly have a hard time listening to that kind of music where it's an emancipated rhythm section and soloists <laughs> trying to somehow like latch well. on. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, that's that's absolutely right. But I mean, uh, you'd have to say that there's no room for the soloist there. But if that is the, actually what the nature of the music is about the interaction with the rhythm section and that you're playing with that, you accept that as the deal. But I know what you're saying. I mean, when I saw even, you know, Weather Report with Pastorius and he was so dominating mm-hmm. and his double stopping technique, <laughs> fantastic playing. But there's really very little you can do over the top of that. Yes. Because everything's filled. Yes. And Wayne Shorter, I mean, I know this was a habit of Wayne Shorter from Weather Report. He was just standing there and he sort of goes, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, okay, I know you're Wayne Shorter and, and you kind of tend to do that, but but you can't really do much else because well, you've got, I mean, the, got the whole thing covered. <laughs> the, the thing that's incredible about Wayne Shorter is how much he sweats compared to how much he plays. Listen, man, I I like them all. This is uh the people yeah, who listen sure, to Marvin are very are, 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 we we unload our bullshit. <laughs> no, no, but, but he does um you know he does every time I've seen particularly Weather Report, he's played very minimally. Yeah, uh, I, I've had to say I can't read his expressions because he always, he always used to look a bit fed up. But yeah. particularly with this Pastorius thing, I thought, well, you know, Pastorius was like centre stage, doing his thing, and I thought, well, you know, you know, get back to the point. I mean, that's great, but I, as a soloist, I couldn't imagine doing anything. Yeah, on top of that, except something really slow. Do you remember Level Forty Two? Yeah. Uh, and then he'd sing, oh. <laughs> I mean, not only is it a masterpiece of coordination, but that's about all you could do is do long, slow notes. It's, it's absolutely true. Control. I mean, there's Control. nothing more inviting for a guitar player than just hearing kind of like a shuffle, like a slow yeah. shuffle, or just like, it's like, oh, the stage is set. Right. It's like, I, I can do anything. Exactly. <laughs> that's what you're looking for. Yeah. People well, that play too busy don't that's understand. That's well, that's why I love, you know, I love, um, you know, when we do those long modal pieces with a soft machine. Yeah, like, I mean, listening to you guys on the finish. cruise, that's what I was, yeah. that's exactly what I was thinking. It's like, wow, this must be like very liberating, yeah. right? It's just very like, you're, yeah, because you can do very whatever you want. Player, no exactly. Player, so I can do any harmony I want. 
Roy mm-hmm. Babington just playing a lot of n- not many notes with a great mm-hmm. thunderous sound. Marshall kicking it up a bit, giving me a bit of, and it's it's great. I love it. Yeah. I mean, that, and then all the drama and the music is just catching waves with like the yeah, rhythm yeah. section. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. No, it's a, it's a great uh, way of playing. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> you should have a go. You come. You can have a go. But it, it, it's great. I mean, honestly, I, I, I it's, you know, people. There's been, you know, not much, but from the moment we kind of got back together, there's sort of, sort of mutterings occasionally like, oh, this isn't a real soft and tune, and where's Kevin Irvin, Mike Reddy? Well, I don't care because I love doing it for the music. Yeah. Because that's the only way it plays play, so I get to play like that. I don't right. get to play like that anywhere else in my musical world, really. I mean, mm-hmm. I love all the things I do, but I never get to go, right, here we go. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Carte blanche, the bloody well play, you know. And, right. You know, no no member of the audience is going to be going, ooh, 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 <laughs> or, uh, oh, you're a bit loud for our club. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought you were going to play Stella by Starlight. Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm very happy to do. Sure. But, um, but uh, a... you know, that's what I love about it. And, I, and that's why I, I, I don't really care. If people, in fact, it was the same in 1975 when I joined after Holdsworth. Uh, there were mutterings then, and I thought, well, I don't care. I don't care. I'm in this band playing with these guys that I've, I've admired for years, uh, uh, and they may not be, you know, uh, Kevin Ayers and Robert Wyatt, but they're the guys I wanted to play with. And sure. I'm, playing, I'm really happy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, I don't have that problem, really. Um <laughs> but uh, I understand, you know, in fact, we've had a good reception. So people are very happy. Even Robert Wyatt's happy about it. Thinks it's good that we're doing what we're doing. And, you That's know, great. And the, the Hidden Details album was, is really happy with it, you know. But there again, recorded. <laughs> you know, all thrashing away. And John Heisman, John Heisman, what a tragic. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's, which is not our. Actually, so you who's Danny? Most of my bloody albums seem to be recorded live, and uh, half the time I'm thinking, you know, the John Williams one, and I'm going, this is 21st century. You know, if I'm playing with John Williams, I'd like to have a chance to redo all my parts and. Right. Um, Never. My live album is live, <laughs> except for one bit that we re- had to redo the whole thing for a couple of mistakes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> In the hall. With the mics up after the concert redo. Just you two in the room? With, with, yeah, because he put yeah. the mics up for that album. There's no separation or anything. They just, he got mics on the amps. So, <laughs> but there was so much room sound and so much spill that I couldn't do any dropping in. Mm-hmm. No dropping in. It's terrifying, but you can hear the terror and it actually works. <laughs> on the it's much more exciting than it would have been if we'd done it. In, in Spanish way. culture, they call it a uh, duende. You know, yeah, that's exactly. like the, the, yeah. So it's, well, there it's, is a bit of duende on that album. Yeah, right? which you wouldn't. Um, I mean, if you hear the first track, extra time, it's it rocks along and it's really duende-ish because you know it's so yeah, because you're scared because you're struggling. Well, <laughs> that's what you want to hear. That's good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, got no, a great it's... player over here. Do you know? Do you ever heard of a piano player called John Taylor? No. He, no, well, John Taylor, he died actually. He did a lot of ECM records. He played with Thurman, played with Jackson. I mean, he was truly a world class uh, player. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, really. I mean, I'm not saying world class like you throw it off. I mean, really. And he's, he was known for his time messing up. Not, mess, not messing up. <laughs> messing with time. Cutting, cutting the, messing up with the time. Cutting up the time. And I was. Early on in my sort of jazz thing, I was teaching, you know, as I told you before, mm-hmm. Bit Blood, at the Barry Summer School, which was a famous jazz school, and he was on it, and they have a tutor's concert, you know, it always starts off with a tutor's concert. So he came up to me and went, let's do a duo. I went, oh, God. <laughs> I said, oh, all right. He went, yeah, what should we do? And I thought, well, let's do a ballad. I've got more chance if we do a ballad. Let's do what's new. And he went, yeah, okay, okay. So we came on, it's like, now, John Taylor, John Effie. And I went, ba-da, and he started. Harmonies, time. You know, <laughs> and I just, I just hung on by earwigging 
kind of to the changes. I didn't know where the one was or anything. <laughs> and we got through it and everybody said it was marvellous. And I came off and I said, oh, God, I felt so insecure. He went, good. Ah! Good. <laughs> and he was right. He went, good. That's well, at least you're paying good. attention. That's when it gets good. <laughs> when you're insecure. Which was Miles Davis's theory. You know, he always put people on edge. That didn't let them play in their comfort zone. Listen to We Want Miles. As soon as Mike Stan starts going, he goes, beep, to stop him. Check it out on the record. Oh, dude. So every time Miles, Mike Stern went into one of his licks, he goes, beep. You put really? Beep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm hilarious. Gonna, I'm going to um, Oh, dude! Oh, thank you so much so for all this. Again, yeah, <laughs> let's we'll, we'll do it again. We'll make it. We'll make I it like a thing. Your theories. You're making me think about. It. Good man. <laughs> all righty. I'll talk to you soon, man. Yeah, talk to you too, man. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye.